The following program is a Town of Colony television production of the William K. Sanford Town Library. Hi, welcome to the latest episode of Mental Health Now. I'm your host, Matthew Shapiro from NAMI New York State, the National Alliance on Mental Illness. Before we start today, um, I just want to reference on our last episode, we had Congressman Paul Tonko and we discussed mental health reform on the federal level. I do want to encourage all our viewers to make sure you register to vote and turn out for the polls this November. I know there's been a, uh, a lot of apathy about the presidential election, but of course there are a lot of down ticket races. Uh, all our legislative seats in New York are up as well as all, as all our House seats. So the deadline to register to vote is uh, October 14th here in New York, and we do encourage uh, everyone to get out and vote. And uh, if you're not registered, you can register online using the Department of Motor Vehicles website. Um, I also want to announce that uh, November 11th through 13th, we'll be having our annual education conference at the Desmond Hotel, right down the street from where we're filming. Um, and we're very excited. On our next episode, we'll be having Dr. Lloyd Setterer, who is one of the main presenters at this year's education conference. For more information about that, you can visit our website at www.namiNYS.org. Um, I'm very happy today to welcome our guest, uh, Keith O'Neill, and today we're going to be discussing the need to tackle the stigma of mental illness. Uh, Keith has a remarkable story. He uh, is a veteran of the National Football League where he played for four years, and he was actually the special teams captain for the 2007 Super Bowl champion Indianapolis Colts. Um, like I said, Keith has a remarkable story, and uh, his journey has led him to being a mental health advocate. And we're so gracious, uh, gracious to have him here today. Grateful to have him here today. And um, this weekend, he's going to be participating in NAMI Walks New York State, which we've told you a lot about at Jennings Landing. Obviously, by the time we hear the walk will happen, but we'll tell you more information later about how you can support our efforts. So, Keith, thank you for being on the show and joining us today. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to be here today. Oh, great. Well. I was so happy to have you. Um, so, as I said, I was, you're uh, um, a veteran of the National Football League where you played for the Indianapolis Colts, the Dallas Cowboys, and for a very short time had the Giants. Um, so, taking it back, I mean, you grew up in kind of a football family, correct? Correct. See, my first, first of all, my father played in the NFL. Mm -hmm. He played uh, seven years. Mm -hmm. He was a first-round draft pick wow. um, back in 1974 for the Detroit Lions. Um, he was uh, quite the player. Mm -hmm. He he was an All-American linebacker at Penn State. Wow. Um, and went on to play for some time in the NFL. Um, then he went into coaching, mm -hmm. and he coached at Rutgers University mm -hmm. uh, down in New Jersey for 11 years. So, so naturally, I grew up around football, mm -hmm. and then I had brothers who played and brother-in-laws who played and wow. so football has always been a part of my life that's awesome and you know while your father like you said was a, a first round draft pick of your journey was a little more diverse and you weren't a, a top prospect one of the things that really is remarkable about you, you've always kind of been an underdog who's managed to succeed correct that's correct and actually uh, a funny little story in in Dallas they kind of uh, referred to me as the Rudy guy mm -hmm. um, you know, my story was a little different than my father's and my brother's. I had to go to school, you know, to a small school. Mm -hmm. um, I was an undrafted free agent. Mm -hmm. um, I really wasn't supposed to make the team in Dallas, um, but I, I stood out and, mm -hmm. and, and made it on special teams. Well, and, you know, you told, I heard you tell a story once before. It's kind of funny how your journey in the NFL began, right? Um, there was a scout who, came, who saw you play but was really scouting another player, and you really stood out somehow, and that's kind of how the whole situation began. Huh? Yeah, exactly. I was uh, it was my junior year. I was playing in a playoff game against Sam Houston State, and I made a, a good play. And mm -hmm. there was a scout there watching a player for Sam Houston State. Mm -hmm. And um, later on down down the road, when we talked about it, he said, you know, I saw you there when I was actually when I was actually scouting somebody else. So, you know, you never know who's watching, mm -hmm. and, which is very true in everything you do in life. Yeah. And I learned a very very uh, valuable lesson that day. 
Yeah, the, I mean, you always have to, you never know who's watching, you never know who's listening. And exactly. It's a remarkable thing. So, when you um, first entered the NFL and you were on draft or free agent, uh, it must have been tough, obviously. And you really, how did you end up fighting your way onto the team? Uh, for me, it was special teams. Mm -hmm. um, Coach Parcells, it was his first year in mm -hmm. Dallas. It was my first year in Dallas. I knew it was going to be tough, but um, Coach Parcells actually coached my father, and my father told me that Parcells would be fair. Mm -hmm. um, so I just fought, and um, I, you know, I gave it everything I, I had. I knew I only had really one opportunity, one chance mm -hmm. to make the NFL uh, a childhood dream of mine. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I played well enough, and I showed the coaches that I could succeed on special teams, and that's how I made it. Yeah, and special teams. You know, in case some of our viewers may not be as familiar with football, obviously people probably know what the offense is and know what the defense is, but the, really the third uh, leg is, is a special team. So it's the, the kickoffs and kicking the game. Yeah, which is very important. You know, a lot of times. Uh, the field position, everything is all settled on that, and it's really the the rock. It's kind of the uh, underappreciated part of football, right? You would say. Yeah, I definitely think it's overlooked. Yeah. Um, it until is, something goes wrong. Until right? something goes wrong, or right, sometimes. Yeah. But it's definitely overlooked. You know, Peyton Manning is not going to be playing on special right. teams. You mm -hmm. have guys like us, the grunts, uh -huh. that play. So. But just like in everything else, they're the ones that really. Uh, get the ball wrong and really the, the foundation for the football team because you really like you say you know where the offense starts out it's based on you know uh, of what you guys can do and stuff and, and and there's a lot of teamwork in with the blocking schemes and everything it's, a, it's an interesting point of the game so um so as you started playing um that's when you first noticed i mean kind of you talked about how you you fought to get on the nfl but in a lot of ways some of your their toughest fights in life has been uh your you know battle with mental illness and mental health issues um and when did you first start noticing those type of symptoms? I really started to notice um, at an early age, mm -hmm. uh, probably around the age of eight, wow. I would say. Um, a lot of anxiety mm -hmm. uh, about about sleeping because I, I would have racing thoughts at night. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, I, I didn't really know what was going on, I mean, what sure. young child would. Mm -hmm. um, but I also was, you know, a very irritable child at times, not all the time. Um, I, was, um, I was labeled lazy, uh, some depression. Mm -hmm. um, and I could, as I look back now, I can see it, you know, a lot clearer. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, I couldn't. But um, that's when I first started really noticing um, symptoms. But throughout my lifetime, they would come and go. And... Um, once I got to the NFL with the pressure, um, a lot of them, a lot of the anxiety, a lot of the, um, you know, those sleepless nights mm -hmm. came back. Sure. So you know, it must have been interesting though, growing up. I mean, for eight years old to have any type of symptoms like that, it's got to be overwhelming, like you say, confusing. But I, I just wonder, in a family like yours where your dad was an NFL player, you were surrounded by football players, big, tough guys, did, was it hard? To, did we were able to talk to your family about what was going on? We were afraid or... Well, to be honest with you, I, I spoke to uh, the females uh -huh. <laughs> in, in the family, to my mother and to my sister, mm -hmm. never the men. Um, and I, I'm okay saying it today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously they're more, uh, they show more empathy, more mm -hmm. sympathy. And, um, but not that I couldn't go to my father because I know he'd be there for me, but that's just who I decided to go seek help to. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's interesting, you know, when we were talking before lunch, I was talking a little bit about my story and how when I got diagnosed with ADHD at a very young age, when I was kicked out of preschool, you know, my mom was my greatest advocate. And uh, my dad didn't really understand. You know, he was uh, 20 years older than my mom from a much different generation where, you know, like you say, you get labeled very easily lazy or depressed or, you know, with not really understanding the root of the problem. So a lot of times, you know, big shout out to the mothers out there because a lot of times especially the old times in NAMI, there was that joke, the NAMI mommies, but a lot of ways are, are you know, mothers very powerful advocates and are more understanding. Absolutely. So, and it's interesting, as you say, with these symptoms came back in the NFL. We hear a lot, obviously, you said you were an undrafted free agent, so you didn't have to go through a, probably a lot of the, the rigors you hear about before the draft, where these guys get, like, wonderlick tests and, and these different things to rate people's stability. So, the, the, it seems like if you're a top prospect coming into the NFL, they want to know about your mental makeup but once you're there do you get uh, mental health support I mean obviously it's a very high pressure job and and you know
now. Um, do they any type of support on that? You know, looking back, it's been you know almost um, 15 years since I was a rookie, mm -hmm. um, and then there wasn't much um, at all of any kind of mental health um, help. Mm -hmm. um, there was. I do remember, believe it or not, I do remember seeing a confidential mental health flyer mm -hmm. on on the bulletin board, mm -hmm. and I remember thinking to myself, I should I should probably give them a call. Right. But still, down, I still didn't think I had a problem. Right. I thought it was just me, you know. Mm -hmm. And it's probably much like you know, in some ways, people a lot of times equate like the NFL culture to military culture. It's very demanding, very strict. There's a set of rules, and you know, we we at NAMI are really trying to encourage veterans and members of the military and their families to seek help because they're very very reluctant to offer because it's seen as a sign of weakness and I'm sure it's very similar in uh, the NFL culture true uh, that's very true I you know you, you call it macho macho mm -hmm. central mm -hmm. you know I mean it's the NFL it's grown men um, mm -hmm. getting paid millions of dollars right. to, to beat each other up right and um, you know it's 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 hard to seek help mm -hmm. um, but I think nowadays, I think it's becoming more normal, mm -hmm. um, as, as normal as normal can be. <laughs> Whatever and, normal and, is. Which, uh, and um, I think uh, they're doing a, a much better job mm -hmm. with the players and mental health, mm -hmm. as far as I've heard. Um, so I just hope that it continues. Right. I mean, for a long time in like baseball or something, they've talked about using sports psychologists and stuff because it's, it's kind of obviously a different game, but because it's more of the I guess considered more of a mental game, whether it's you know the pitching or the hitting. And it's funny, a, a joke. I have a friend who's a weatherman. I always a big baseball fan. I go, weathermen and, and baseball batters are the only jobs where you can get it wrong, you know, thirty percent <laughs> of the time and still be considered great. So it's like that. But dealing with failure and stuff, it's kind of an interesting metaphor. So. Um, as you moved along in your career, so you went, how long did you, you were in Dallas for two, two. two years, yes, and then sir. you moved on to the Indianapolis Colts, and uh, you worked your way up to being a special teams captain, and uh, were captain of the team that won the Super Bowl, so what was that experience like? The Super Bowl? Yeah, well, <laughs> the whole, the whole you know, just, season. It was, uh, it was dynamic, I mean, mm -hmm. playing with, you know, such guys like Peyton Manning and Dwight Freeney and Marvin Harrison mm -hmm. and Dallas Clark and the list goes on. Mm -hmm. um, it was just, it was, it was an amazing time in my life. Mm -hmm. And um, to be at the pinnacle of your profession, of, if not your life, playing the Super Bowl was, mm -hmm. it was uh, outstanding. Yeah. It was great. And it must have been difficult. You know, I was just reading a story um, about Olympians. And a lot of times, you know, obviously the, a lot of these Olympians, every four years they get this opportunity to shine. It's not like, you know, an NFL player where you have seasons every year where you have millions of people watching. And, you know, they work all these years to get to that point. They have their event, and then it's over, you know. Maybe they'll do it in four years after that, but a lot of them, after they've reached that kind of pinnacle, kind of have like a depression. Did that happen for you after winning the Super Bowl or? Um I was actually on cloud nine for a while. Mm -hmm. um, but then I, I, um, I got released the next year on an injury settlement and mm -hmm. um, went to the New York Giants. And that's when I actually walked away from the game mm -hmm. uh, on my own um, due to um, my bi undiagnosed bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. So my depression was a little different than just um, you know, missing the game. Mm -hmm. and I think that's very normal for a lot of players um, to go through just, you know, being around the, the teammates, playing a competitive sport, mm -hmm. you know, going to work every day, going to work with friends. Um, and then when all of a sudden one day it's over, mm -hmm. I think having a, going through a depression is, is normal. Um, but with me, I had that and the transition into the real world on top of being newly diagnosed with an illness was, uh, was very difficult for me and my family. Sure. Um, so can you talk, so when you were in the NFL, you thought it was just an anxiety disorder, but then, like you say, after your retirement, it led to being diagnosed as a bipolar disorder. Can you talk about how it kind of what led to that? Sure. Um, well, after I retired, my wife and I moved back to Buffalo, New York, my mm -hmm. hometown, and we wanted to start a family, and uh, my wife got pregnant, and uh, we had a miscarriage, mm -hmm. and that was my trigger, and I went, uh, your typical manic episode, mm -hmm with um, euphoria and working 18 hours a day and spending sprees and, um, you know, delusional thinking, mm. 
hallucinations. Um, and then I was finally diagnosed at 30 years old with bipolar one disorder. Mm. Um, and I was in a mixed state at the time of diagnosis. And then, um, you know, I fell into a depression for, for a very long time. Mm. And, um, about 18 months of being very unstable and going through a lot of different medications. I finally, you know, saw a therapist, I mean, a specialist mm -hmm. and, um, he got me on the right path. Right. And there were good resources available in Buffalo. Uh, yes. Yeah, so actually my wife did go to NAMI. Right. Um, we did speak about that earlier and, um, she's a big fan, a big advocate of NAMI. Mm. Um, I'm excited to see some of the NAMI people tomorrow. Oh, and um, yes, there's great resources. I went to some support groups and, um, you know, but it's, you know, it's like anything, um, finding the right doctor that works for you, finding the right therapist that works. And that's, you know, an important thing. We were talking a little bit before too. I think a lot of times people will know they have a problem. Maybe it's even been diagnosed, but they go to a therapist and that relation, it doesn't click. They don't feel comfortable with them or they get put on a medication that doesn't work for them and they give up. And a lot of times it is very much a trial and error, finding the therapist that works for you and finding a medication that works for you. So, I mean, uh, would you say a big piece of advice is just uh, the kind of the tenacity that you had to get into the NFL and to make is really helped you, you know, get through the illness and fight through part of the, the difficulties. And that's really what we tell people all the time is that you can't give up. You have to keep fighting and yeah. things don't always work on the first time and, and to keep at it. And, and, you know, we always say the road in recovery is never straight and it's never smooth. It's, you know, it's windy and bumpy and, and you know, yeah, it's absolutely, persistence. Absolutely. Yeah. You have to, um, things aren't going to work right out of the gate right um i mean they it's probably very rare if they do um for me it took I mean, i'm still working on it mm -hmm. i'm still changing my medication i've been diagnosed for five years i'm still changing it but i never i thought i was in this nightmare that never was going to end mm -hmm. and it did end um and that's just by not giving up um listening to your doctors um uh, going to therapy trying the medications um, as much as they might make you feel terrible. Mm -hmm. um, but there is a, a cocktail that might work for you. And I finally found mine and it took a long time. Well, that's great. And uh, so glad to hear you've gone through that dark period. In fact, one of the programs we, we have is our Inner Own Voice program, which teaches people with a mental illness to articulate their disease and go out and talk about it to all sorts of groups, doctors, nurses, um, uh, people who, uh, you know, uh, employers, uh, human resource people, things like that. So you really understand what mental illness really is. There's still so much uh, misconceptions about there. And there's really a section called the dark days. And I think everyone gets uh, talks about that. But, you know, th that people know you can get through those dark days. As bad as they are, there, there is a light at that tunnel. And, and you just need to get there. And, you know, like you said, a big thing for you was having your family support, um, your wife. And, you know, a lot of people who do have a mental illness, it can uh, ruin marriages. And you're very lucky that uh, you have an understanding what if you were saying your wife's a nurse, so she kind of gets a medical thing. And um, the re support she's received from NAMI really helped you, you know, uh, kind of be, she's a, a strength for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, absolutely. I, I mean, family support is, is crucial. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, who else, who else is there for you? Mm -hmm. I mean, at, at times when, you know, uh, during those dark days, yeah. as you say, and, um, you know, I had times when I was, um, you know, very suicidal and in the hospital and um, my wife was stood by my side and, f for, you know, my parents, they mm -hmm. stood by my side and, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's not easy. Yeah. It, it took a toll on them, too. Right. And that we always say, you know, mental illness doesn't just impact the individual, it impacts the whole family. And that's really so important what NAMI does is uh, giving both the individual and the family the tools that they need both through education and support to help someone's recovery and you know the program that your wife took is our, our family to family program which we've discussed on the show before it's a 12 week program that's taught by family members who have lived experience it really shows all the ins and outs that a family member would need to support a loved one's recovery communication strategies insights to the illness how how to advocate for a loved one and um, 
how to you know, seek out services, things like that. And we offer all these programs at no cost to the community. It's, it's really, we never, there's enough barriers to getting people into care that we never want finances to be a barrier. So that's why we offer all our signature programs free of cost. And one of the ways we're able to do this is through fundraising efforts. And Keith is here uh, in the capital region this weekend as we're going to be having our NAMI walk in um, Jennings Landing on Saturday. And all the funds raised through the walk uh, will go to help programs like Family to Family and an in Inner Own Voice and Peer to Peer and our Connection Support Group. And also, I mentioned our education conference coming up in November. And again, we never want finances to be a barrier. And it allows us to um, give out scholarships to people who would not be able to attend the conference anyway. So we're, we're so grateful for you to come in and, and do uh, the walk and, and help us raise awareness and funds. And as well as supporting NAMI, you have your own foundation as well, the Fourth and Forever Foundation. If people want to look on that, that's for the number four, T-H-A-N-D, forever.org. And can you tell me what you're doing with that? Sure. So, you know, we're a small foundation. Mm -hmm. um, we're doing the best we can. We are, uh, one thing we're doing is we are, are erasing stigma, mm -hmm. and we're also funding research mm -hmm. at um, the University at Buffalo. That's great. We're helping with that, and um, it's very rewarding. Um, it's something that um, you know I wanted to do um, because the University at Buffalo really did help me out when mm -hmm. I was in a really really dark time, and um, you know it's it's it's. It gives gives me purpose. That's great. It's it gives gives the people a lot a lot of purpose. So that's awesome, and we're so grateful for. It. I mean, there's so many different organizations we work with, and we're all in this together, and we're better together. And um, we're glad that you're here. You know, you're part of the Nami family officially. As you know, your family got help for here. But you know, we want to. You know, anything that's getting the word out, especially research. We talk about this all the time. That in many ways, research is our hope for the future. And you know, we it's, we all often say that the brain is kind of the last frontier of research, and um, but we do need to support our research institutions, and they're making a bunch of a lot of difference. And it's kind of funny. So no one ever, no matter what kind of advocate you are, I don't think anyone ever really starts out to say, "I want to be an advocate," especially for something for mental health. It's usually no. a, a journey like ours that kind of <laughs> leads you to this point. And, and it's funny. I often think I kind of told you how the story how I ended up in NAMI, and you know that. All the pain and, and things that I've gone through and that you've gone through, it's gotten you to a place where you can help others. And, and you're really doing that. You're giving back in so many different ways. Yeah. And uh, I want to ask you some of the other things you're doing. I mean, we talked about talking to different organizations and talking to kids. And um, mm -hmm. can you talk about some of the work that you're doing to raise awareness? Uh, Absolutely. I, um, you know, I go into uh, high schools, local high schools in the Western New York area. I'm from, mm -hmm. I'm from Buffalo. Mm -hmm. um, I've only been in the Western New York area. Mm -hmm. I will travel pretty much anywhere uh, within the New York State, and I go in and uh, talk to them about my story, mm -hmm. uh, talk to them about mental health, talk to them the, about the importance of getting help, about um, living, you know, a healthy life. Mm -hmm. um, I've also, you know, go around and speak at different uh, organizations like NAMI or Mental Health uh, America mm -hmm. and um, smaller organizations and things like that. Right. And I first actually met Keith at um, the Brain and Behavioral Research Foundation that funds a lot of the research that we're talking about. It's interesting, you know, I think on the show before we've talked about our relationship with the National Institute of Mental Health, which also is a federal uh, organization that funds a lot of the research. But uh, as a federal uh, organization that's investing your money, they want to more uh, fund more sure things or things that are further along where Brain and Behavioral Research Foundation funds more things that are a little more experimental and you never know what what could work. In fact, it was kind of funny not to get too into this, but I was talking to Keith. We just, this week, some information came out that uh, a drug that had been used as a uh, performing enhancing drug for athletes now shows that it could be beneficial for people with bipolar disorder. So as it uh, improves cognitive functions for people with uh, brain you know, depressive disorders. So, you know, we always have to look into these things. It's always exciting development. So, um, and it's so awesome that you are getting in there and talking to kids. Uh, we've had a whole episode about mental health and education in schools and things. And I think, obviously, that age you know, is always difficult. And, you know, a lot of times, these symptoms like with yourself where you were started feeling them at eight years old and then you were afraid to ask for help I think most kids are would be afraid to ask for help like we discussed it it's kind of is a sign of weakness or 
perceived to be a sign of weakness. Actually, uh, the First Lady, uh, Michelle Obama, just did an interview this week talking about trying to cut down on the stigma of mental illness and just saying, actually asking for help is a sign of strength. It's not a sign of weakness. And it must be so inspiring for the kids to see someone like you who's, who's been in the NFL, a big, strong guy, who can say, I've had a problem. It's OK. I got help for it, and I got through of it. So what type of reaction do you get from the kids when you talk to them? I get a, a wide range of reactions. Um, some that stick out to me is um, one in particular was a, a, a student, a high school student um, at a high school in Western New York. Um, actually, at the end during question and answer, um, stood up and said, you know, I have bipolar disorder. And this is the first time that um, I'm talking about it or I've told anybody wow. and that to me that just gives me the goosebumps you know yeah. gives me chicken skin because sure. um, that takes a lot for that kid to stand right. up and you know it's who knows if I wouldn't have come in that yeah. day and said anything maybe he wouldn't have and you know I hope he went home that day and he felt good about yeah. himself and now that because it is hard for, I mean I remember when I was diagnosed I didn't tell anybody for three years wow. and so this kid who's in high school and he's probably going through a lot and yeah. just to be able to go in and help these kids and you know and 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 break the stigma and it's a big deal and it's so important too because not only did that kid get up and saying it, but maybe, you know, I'm sure he's never told his friends before. So if he was feeling down or something and his friends probably didn't know why, and, you know, everyone needs support. I mean, we talked about what your wife's been able to give you. And, you know, it's so, a lot of times we'll get calls from people where they think a friend has something and they don't know what to do. And, and yeah. just to be able to discuss it openly and know that there's help available is, is fantastic. So we're almost out of time. Um, just really quick. To, and, and really hats off to you, because as we discussed before, as much as that kid struggled to tell his story, it's got to be very difficult to go up there and talk about these things and relive your dark days. And um, so, thank you. We, well, thank you for doing it. You're doing yeah. the hard work. You're the one going through it. And uh, we were talking before. You have a. You're in the process of writing a book too about your I experiences. Am. And <laughs> I mean, the process has been taking about four years. Well. It's, it's difficult, but yes, it's um, it's titled Under My Helmet. Mm -hmm. um, it should be out next August. Um, I'm working with a great ghostwriter mm -hmm. who really challenges me every mm -hmm. day and I'm really excited for it to be out. Well we're excited for it to be out too and um, as, when it is we're going to be sure to let everyone know where to get the book and to read it and to learn more about Keith's story and as I said Keith is here for our walk which is going to be taking place this weekend but by the time we air uh, it will be over but you can still support NAMI New York State. You can still support the walk um, by visiting our website NAMINYS.org and uh, support, learn about the work we're doing and how to support it. Um, so thank you so much, Keith, for all that you're doing and for being our thank guest you. today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Oh, it's our pleasure. And a as we say all the time to close the show, a, a big saying in NAMI is that hope starts with you. And once again, you've really personified that for so many people. For th so thank you for doing that. Thank you. And thank you for watching Mental Health Now. We'll see you next time. Thank you.